Um, we also had a meeting on Monday of the um, Joint Task Force with NASA, or pardon me, with Leading Age. This is a, a group of five people from each organization, and the purpose is to try to uh, de develop a relationship between um, NACRA and leading age uh, that can persist and in, into the future. Well, one, what happened at that meeting was that we had a, a lengthy discussion by just about everybody present of, of views. There are five people there representing leading age and uh, four of the five that were uh, designated to represent NACRA at that meeting. The one person that was missing was uh, Bennett Napier, the, the president and CEO of Partners in Association Management. Um, he had a uh, birthday for his wife that he had to attend, and so he, he, he felt that was, was more important. It was their, her 50th birthday. Uh, we talked a lot. We didn't um, um, make any uh, specific plans, uh, but we did exchange views. I think it was more of a get acquainted meeting um, than anything else. We intended to, to uh, try to get to understand each other better. There was a, some concern expressed uh, about the fact that uh, there is a um, division within NACRA on whether or not we should have a formal affiliation with leading age. Uh, we discussed that to some degree. And then at the end, we decided that for the time being, we would not um, have a formal affiliation but that we would continue to discuss opportunities for working together uh, by email and by telephone, and then we would meet again uh, in Indianapolis at some point during the uh, uh, Leading Age Expo, which is going to be in Indianapolis in October. I was hoping that we might come to some um, agreement on a task for this summer, but we didn't. We didn't do that. We did discuss some of the issues that we b believe in and are important, and uh, the leading age people um, discussed some of the issues that they consider to be important. The issues they discussed were primarily related to housing for. Um, uh, affordable housing uh, for people that, that with low income, and um, the things we discussed had to do with primarily with financing issues. Uh, the subject of the hospitalization uh, entry situation, whether you're an outpatient or inpatient, came up, and there statement was made that that seemed to be an almost done deal with the Congress. They anticipated that there would be more action this summer uh, to try to correct that situation. Exactly how that's going to come out, we don't know yet. This is Brenda. I do recall Katie saying that the first time we met her, that there are so many people whose parents are aging in Congress that they recognize that this is a, you know, a crisis. So she felt very optimistic that it was going to change for the better sooner. Yeah. Uh, this is Jack. I might uh, supplement. Uh, this We've been working with Leading Age with, for the time that I've known uh, since uh, May 2010. I'm sure there were things before that. This was the first time that they brought us together with providers and didn't just uh, move us off onto their staff group. 
Uh, one of the uh, uh, agreements that, that, or consensus that seemed to emerge is that if we're going to really work together in partnership, you don't need to have a written contract because we're not going to litigate with each other. We're going to work together, and we ought to focus first on the things that we can do together and less on the trappings and mechanics of uh, organization and this, that, and the other thing. They brought their A team, uh, the the most vibrant members of the group were Terry Cunliffe, who is the CEO of Covenant Retirement Communities, which is a very large um, retirement you know, multi-facility. They have many properties all over the United States, including Florida, including California. <clears throat> and um, she was tremendously dynamic and very positive about the cooperation. We also met Sean Kelly, who is the new CEO of Kendall Corporation, which is probably the leading CCRC provider in the nation. And he was very positive. And we touched on questions like uh, for-profit versus non-profit organization. Uh, there was absolute agreement on the, three, the injustice of the three-day observation requirement. It was a very constructive, positive conversation moving forward. The liaison from the Leading Age side is Steve Mogg, who before he came on Leading Age staff was a defense attorney for the providers. And like many defense attorneys, he likes to delay things and sort of uh, uh, keep them from moving in a way which he might consider adverse to his client base. And that's certainly been the case here. But if we're able to move past that barrier and work directly with these provider executives, I for one am very hopeful that the solutions will come not only from legislation, but from leadership from the organizations and how they move forward to empower their residents and to work to protect things like entry fees. We, had, we did have a, a, a brief discussion of the need for protection for entry fees, and I didn't sense any pushback from the provider group. The other provider members were Roberta Jacobson. I think she was a little in over her head. She's president of Front Porch Communities, which is a California multi-facility group. Uh, but you know, being with Terry and and uh, Sean Kelly, who are very dynamic, forward-thinking leaders, she was in a little over her head. And then there was Tom Aiken, who uh, from North Carolina. He's the leading age CEO there. Uh, he didn't really participate much. He mostly listened. And uh, I don't remember, in fact, him saying anything. I, that's probably his general mode. But I was very favorably impressed by the fact that they brought these top leaders who can actually move the industry and do something to have us move forward. So I came away uh, very upbeat and very pleased with the meeting. That's great. Any comments um, from the audience? Okay. I was really glad to hear that about Covenant Woods because we have independent members from there, and they are the ones who, who express the most dissatisfaction with their management. So I'm going to shoot off an email to them. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be quite appropriate. Uh, I did talk with her. She came to me later. You know, uh, I was there. I think I was the only one who went up on to Capitol Hill for the for the visits on the Hill. We we met with a, a senator staff. You know, they, they you meet with staff members and with our congressmen. But um, during the time while we were waiting for those visits, there were events going on, and she came up and was particularly enthusiastic about what we might do. But uh, she recognized that the Swedish Lutheran background of the organization that she uh, leads comes from a very conservative base. So she can only move so fast. You know, she has to be right. 
to work with her board and uh, the constituency there. So I'm not surprised at what you say. Uh, Jack Snader was also present, and and he may he he probably has a, another set of observations that he could share that would give you perspective. Because you know my view was sort of the polar opposite of Walt Boyer's, and uh, I think you can benefit by getting this. I think this is the most important thing to have taken place uh, in recent years. And it, it was brought about because we have NACRA. I don't think we could have done it any other way. This is Gerard Highland. What was said about for-profit versus non-profit? Seems to me that the for-profit are is increasing uh, market share. Uh, well, it was more a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me about. Uh, whether uh, these you can really keep these communities current and attractive for new generations of incoming residents without having access to the equity capital markets. Right now, they use the entry fees as the at-risk capital to protect the bondholders. So the, the bondholders then are only interested in whether uh, there's cash to meet their payments when they come due. And uh, these are heavily financed with bond financing, which typically carries a higher cost, a higher, you know, they determine, they require a higher return uh, because of the risky nature of the nonprofit structure where you don't have access to the equity capital markets to uh, shield the bondholders. <coughs> so the cost structure is adversely affected, and uh, the, these, are, these are financial matters that are pretty sophisticated. And uh, the, I'd say that Terry Cunliffe and uh, Sean Kelly were the ones who fully grasped the, that conversation. Was there a uh, a solution to the uh, need for equity financing by not for profits? Not for profits uh, do not have accountability and do not have access to the equity markets. Yeah. Is there a solution to that? Uh, I don't know of one. Would do you? Oh well, no. I, I I'm asking was a solution for that issue discussed at your meeting? No, we were just really getting acquainted and touching okay. on, on questions. I, you know, that, uh, what kind of a solution would you envision? Well, the one that, that would come to my mind is one that you and I have discussed, and, and that is uh, some of the uh, variations on the uh, uh, not-for-profit business model uh, such as uh, having uh, condo or co-op ownership of the independent uh, uh, housing units and, and then leaving the common areas and health care for the uh, uh, not-for-profit. Okay. You know, and we've discussed that, and there have been some papers presented at Leading Age on that subject. Okay, yeah. well, that's a highly technical area, but yes. I didn't, I didn't remember, don't remember that coming up, but, and um, of course, the difference between leading age and NACRA in, in that leading age deals strictly with not-for-profit organizations, whereas NACRA deal, deals with both, did come up. I don't know whether leading age is going to change very soon, but I came away with the impression that uh, at some Future time, they may have to reconsider their their position. Well, you know, the the what, I, what Jack and I just discussed was that possibly a hybrid of the for profit and not for profit would work out to everybody's satisfaction. Yeah, I, residents, I understand. residents, and my, operators. My sister lives in, a, in an organization that's like that out in Arizona. And, uh, it would probably be beneficial for them. You know. Any other comments uh, on the meetings we had in Washington? 
This is Jack Nader. From, I agree with uh, what Jack Coming said about the uh, his perception of leading age. Only I came to it the same conclusion from a slightly different perspective. I was looking at what their what they were thinking about as they looked at us. In other words, can we establish a relationship? Because for a long period of time, we sort of ignored them and didn't respond to some of their overtures to us and. Here they were taking a risk, literally, in meeting with us, and I think uh, it exceeded my expectations of what we might expect to get out of that. I think everybody in the in the room performed reasonably well in terms of uh, showing that we're not bad people to deal with, and they aren't bad people to deal with, and I think the air is now clear to begin to make some progress. If I have any disappointment, I'm not sure what we do between now and um, October in Indianapolis when we'll get together again. I would have hoped that there would be some bone left on the table that we could uh, mutually chew on and discuss it because there was no action planning taken at all. Not that I expected any, but I think they could have tossed something out or we could have tossed something out and seen where it went. It did nothing like that happen, but I think the air is clear and that's about as good as we could have expected from my perspective. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, what you're, you're discussing there, Jack, is I think they were looking to Steve Mogg to coordinate and yeah. and action is not his style. Yeah, you know, that may be part of the answer right there. I, I, um, I, I think my disappointment and I believe also Bob Nicholson's was to, just as uh, Jack Snader has expressed, we didn't take any action to continue this over the summer or to do anything specific. Um, having spent some 30 years in the Navy, and part of which I was a, a revol involved with our good friend Admiral Rickover, uh, his... his um, Meeting agendas always came out with action points, and if we didn't have something coming out with an action, he saw no reason for a meeting. And I guess that's where my disappointment was, that we didn't have a follow-on uh, action that uh, that we were going to consider over the summer. Right, and if if any of those people change on that committee, uh, it'll be all – It'll be almost like starting over again from that one person's perspective. Why am I here? Who are these people? What are we talking about? Um, and that that's unfortunate. But uh, I'm still optimistic and believe that uh, the air has been cleared. I just wish we had something to work on. And maybe, Jack, from your perspective, uh, there's something can be done with MOG in terms of moving something forward. Uh, I don't know. I would think there would have to be something going back to them which represents NACRA, and I don't know what is planned in that area. Yeah, that's something I've been trying to give some thought to. My experience with him, and I, you know, the, the 2010 meeting that I mentioned was, uh, you know, we flew out to meet with him. Uh, it was May 18th, 2010. I remember it well, and uh, he was. Uh, I, it was like going to a deposition, a hostile deposition. You know, he wouldn't pay the parking. He wouldn't do this. He wouldn't do that. Uh, that's that's his background. That's his style. He's very good at defending uh, a, a one-sided point of view of things. My experience over the years has been that you have to find a way to put him in a box where he has to act or be revealed for being uh, passively aggressively containing progress and uh, we'll have to think about how to do that while m maintaining the goodwill of the organization and uh, of course we all love Steve Mogg and we love to have him come and he comes and gives wonderful speeches well said <laughs> okay um, <laughs> along that this is Gerard Hyland again along that line of finding something to engage them with you mentioned that one of the points that was discussed was observation versus admission status in a hospital. Uh, there seems to be a number of issues coming down the road uh, from out of Medicare. Um, 
uh, such as a uh, hospital assuming responsibility for post-discharge complications. Uh, would that be an area that you might uh, create a reason for ongoing discussions during the summer? That's, that's one of the situations that I understand the hospitals are very concerned about in that, and, and it's the reason for this observation admittance issue. Um, if the hospital admits you as, as uh, uh, under observation rather than a formal admis admission, when you're discharged, they're not, if you have to come back two weeks later with the same com complaint, uh, they don't get penalized by Medicare. If they admit you formally and then you come back two weeks later with the same problem, the hospitals get penalized by Medicare, and they're trying to avoid those penalties. In, I, in that latter case, will a hospital want to uh, be in the position of telling you where you go for nursing care? Yeah, I think you're talking you, about two separate things. Yeah, mm -hmm. one one is the reimbursement rules by CMS that penalize hospitals for readmissions. The other is the new requirement for bundled payments, for example, for uh, knee and hip replacements, the bundled payment uh, is going into effect as of April 1, 2016, and the hospital re will receive a bundled payment, which will include payment for the rehab and uh, post-acute care. So if the hospital wants to, the hospital would have to agree to discharge that patient to the nursing center in your CCRC if you want to go back there, and they're only going to do that if it's to their financial benefit, and the hospital will be in the driver's seat on that, and that is going to make it very difficult to continue to have skilled nursing facilities in CCRCs. So the result is that a number of CCRCs, particularly on the East Coast, are delicensing their skilled nursing facilities to get out from under these onerous CMS requirements and are instead repurposing re uh, those facilities as high acuity assisted living to take care of the chronically uh, impaired elderly population and uh, foregoing, it looks like the, the hip and knee replacement business, which has been the lucrative image, um, lucrative um, uh, response or initiative that has allowed the skilled nursing facilities to at least approach break even under the CMS rules that that will be going away. And you have to realize that the CMS uh, reimbursements to skilled nursing facilities are less than what the cost is of providing the quality service. So uh, that is a challenging area. It's a, something that concerns the providers. Uh, Walt also mentioned, though, that they're very concerned about affordable housing. And that's something that is not necessarily in our area, but that's the quid pro quo. We can offer grassroots support for their advocacy on behalf of affordable housing in return for their support for protections <coughs> that our excuse me that our members need. <coughs> I'm getting over a cold, and I apologize for that. Does it that allow then for further discussion over the summer? That, that's really the point of my comment. Uh, I, I don't think that we're going to set the timetable here unilaterally. No, yeah, I would agree with that. You know, and it's it's uh, it's really up to Jack and Steve Mogg to to set that timetable. I agree with with Jack Cumming that Steve is 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 not going to be anxious to proceed at a rapid pace. Um, are there any other comments from the audience before we move on to the next subject? Well, 